Last November 2020 saw the most contentious election in US history. I'm sure you all remember perfectly well what happened. The increase in voter turnout, postal voting, the swing in favour of the Democrats, and accusations of all kind with no basis that ended with the storming of the Capitol itself. However, that experience served to suddenly raise a lot of questions about how exactly American democracy works, and in particular about the tools that can generate electoral results that don't always correspond to what the majority of the people voted for. And no, I'm not talking about the allegations poured out by Trump or his friend with the horns on Capitol Hill, but rather by things like gerrymandering. It's a political instrument quite unknown outside the country, but which is a machine for distorting electoral results. And be careful, because all of this was not invented by Clinton or Obama or Bush or Fox News or whatever supervillain your camp happens to have. We are actually talking about a practice that is more than two centuries old that representatives of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party resort to. So the question is, what is gerrymandering? Why isn't it illegal? And more importantly, what might gerrymandering mean in the coming years? Today on Visual Politic, we're going to answer all of those questions, but first, let's look at a little bit of history. Jerry's Salamander. The US electoral system is complex. It does not boil down to who gets the most votes. Remember, for example, what happened in 2016 when Trump won the election despite having three million fewer votes than Hillary Clinton. Something that, by the way, has happened five times and always benefited the Republican Party. Such are the quirks of the Electoral College. Even so, this isn't due to vote manipulation. You see, as you all know, the United States is a federation of 50 states that have been incorporated in dribs and drabs since 1787. Today, its federal form is absolutely consolidated, but the differences between the various states have always been evident throughout the years, even coming to blows with the American Civil War in the mid-19th century. And this is why, from the very beginning, an electoral mechanism was put into place to fulfil a mission, to avoid the victory of a candidate supported only by one region of the country, even though that support was very, very strong. This is why the United States does not vote directly for the president, but for the Electoral College. And whoever gets the most votes in a state gets all the votes of that state in the Electoral College. It doesn't matter how strong the margin of victory is. Whether you win the state by one point or by 25, the number of delegates you get are the same. We all know this, and it is precisely what explains why there is no correspondence between the popular vote and the final result of the presidential election. But the fact that there is no proportionality in the presidential elections does not mean that there is manipulation. Gerrymandering is not at work here. Gerrymandering is used in legislative elections, both for the state legislatures and for the House of Representatives at the federal level. Why? Well, because in presidential elections, each state forms a single constituency. However, in the legislative elections, the territory of each state is divided to assign a seat to each district. And since those in charge of dividing the territory are the politicians themselves, it results in gerrymandering, producing effects as outrageous as this one. Republicans won 50.3% of North Carolina's votes for Congress. They took 10 of 13 seats. News Observer. That's right, 10 out of 13 represent 77% of the seats North Carolina has in the House of Representatives. So the Democrats, with 46% of the votes, only received 23% of the seats. And here. Right here is where gerrymandering comes in. Because districts are not like states which are geographically defined. Districts change periodically, every 10 years for both the state legislature and for the House of Representatives. The territory is divided into as many districts as there are seats up for grabs. The only requirement is that all districts have more or less the same number of people. And then the candidate with the most votes in a district wins that seat. <laughs> So exactly how the district maps are drawn is extremely important because there are two ways to draw the lines. It can be done as it is done in the state of Iowa, where computer software designed to avoid splitting counties and that does not take into account political interests is used to draw the districts. Of course, when done this way, the districts are almost exemplary. But unfortunately, this isn't the norm. In most states, it has traditionally been the political party that dominates the state legislature that defines the electoral districts. And when they resort to gerrymandering, the district maps start to take on some very odd shapes. How odd? Well, check out this one from Illinois' 4th Congressional District. 
If you squint, that kind of looks like some of the more modern Pokemon you have to catch. But by now, many of you may be wondering, gerrymandering, but why on earth is it called that? Couldn't they say something simpler, like they manipulate, rig, or distort the maps to get their way in elections? Well, in order to explain why it's called gerrymandering, we have to go back to 1812. <laughs> Time, the governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gerry, enacted a measure that changed the districts to give an electoral advantage to his party, the Democratic Republican Party, founded by Thomas Jefferson. The new district was oddly shaped, and a newspaper, the Boston Gazette, published this cartoon. The new district took the form of a salamander, and so the term gerrymander was born, from the combination of the governor's surname, Gerry, with salamander. Sounding more like a Pokemon, and it's pretty curious, right? The point is that the goal of gerrymandering is very simple. Draw legislative districts, maximizing your chances while minimizing your opponent's options. And many of you will say, well, this doesn't exactly sound like fair play, and surely someone's trying to stop it, right Grant? Well, the answer is yes. One is William Whitford, a law professor at the University of Wisconsin, who denounces the gerrymandering that has been practiced by Republicans in this state. To give you an idea, in the last elections, the candidates of the Democratic Party won 53% of the votes, but only got 38% of the Congress seats. But the Democrats also use gerrymandering when they can. In Maryland, for example, they designed the map to take seven of the eight districts in play for the House of Representatives. Seems totally legit, right? The fact is, is that Whitford is very clear about what exactly gerrymandering is. In a democracy, citizens are supposed to choose their legislators. In Wisconsin, legislators have chosen their voters through redistricting that makes it practically impossible for Democrats to capture a majority in the state assembly, no matter how many votes they get statewide for Democrat candidates. William Whitford, a University of Wisconsin law professor emeritus. Professor Whitford made it all the way to the Supreme Court, but without much success to speak of. So do you want to know how the courts have ruled on the matter? Of course you do, so stay tuned. Before we do that, what do you think of these banging t-shirts I'm wearing? Do you like them? Well, they are part of a series of exclusive products that we have prepared for all our supporters on Patreon at level 3 or above. So if you want to support Visual Politic and get exclusive swag like this, then don't forget to take a look on our Patreon page. But for now, my amazing fashion sense aside, let's move on. Gerrymandering, case dismissed. Gerrymandering has been addressed by the US Supreme Court on numerous occasions, and the answer given by the highest federal court has always been the same. It's not very elegant, but it is not a matter that the judiciary can control. In 2004, however, there was almost a change when the nine justices on the Supreme Court were split over the possibility of placing limits on gerrymandering. But in the end, it was business as usual. The judge decisive in tipping the balance argued that the problem was that the formula for imposing restrictions on gerrymandering that did not involve substantial intrusion into the political life of the nation had not been found yet. 14 years later, in 2018, gerrymandering took center stage at the Supreme Court once again. And once again, it came out on top. Supreme Court declines to set limits on political gerrymandering, Wall Street Journal. Broadly speaking, what the Supreme Court has come to say about gerrymandering is that it is much better to stay out of politics, which is the business of the state parliaments. Provided, however, that it is not being used to be prejudicial to a minority with the intention of discriminating on racial grounds. In short, the US Supreme Court has given the green light to partisan gerrymandering. Having overcome the judicial hurdle, the only barrier to gerrymandering comes from initiatives such as those led by the group Voters Not Politicians. We're talking about activists in Michigan who got the necessary support so that the citizens of the state could vote in a referendum on whether or not they wanted to put an end to this practice once and for all. And amazingly, Voters Not Politicians achieved their goal, and the design of voting districts in Michigan has been placed in the hands of a commission made up of equal parts representatives of the two major parties and citizens chosen by lottery. Similar commissions have been operating in Arizona and California for decades, and initiatives like Voters Not Politicians have been replicated in other states like Colorado, Utah, and Missouri. This is all well and good, but there are two problems. First, this initiative does not work for everyone because it is only considered in about 10 other states. And the second is that human beings are often quite contradictory. And in Missouri, that does seem to be the case. Voters repeal clean Missouri redistricting plan they enacted in 2018. Missouri Independent. Thanks Missouri for making us all look bad. But what would you say if I told you that all this gerrymandering threatens the Democratic Party's majority in the next election? Check this out. The Census. 
Every 10 years, the same movie is repeated in the United States. The masterpiece, Independence Day. I'm kidding. All years ending in zero, like the last one, 2020, are census years. And that census triggers a process at the political level, redistricting. The 435 members of the House of Representatives are redistricted every 10 years to give more representation to states that have gained more population versus those that have lost population or have grown less since the last census. In terms of the latest census, the change in the White House has been very important. And you see, one of Trump's last measures was to exclude illegal immigrants from the official census counts, something that Biden annulled the day after his inauguration. And that, curiously, may have bad consequences for the Democratic Party. By repealing Trump's census order on unauthorized immigrants, Biden just gave Texas GOP an extra House seat or two. Dallas News. Indeed, Texas is expected to be the state that will benefit the most from the new reapportionment. Under Trump provisions, it was going to gain only one representative. But by also counting irregular immigrants, Texas is now expected to gain up to two new seats, and Florida another one. We are talking about two states that have been Republican strong strongholds for more than 20 years. On the other hand, Democratic Party strongholds such as Illinois, New York and California are losing seats. And remember that in the last elections for the House of Representatives, the Democrats barely had an advantage of nine representatives. So all indications point to the Republicans potentially taking over the House majority in the 2022 midterm elections simply because of the new reapportionment without needing to win more support. And at this point, it is very, very important to underline the importance of gerrymandering. Why? Because the increase in the populations of Texas and Florida comes mostly from the growth on the outskirts of the big cities. And the truth is, is that the urban voter tends to vote Democrat. In fact, the mayors of the 10 largest US cities are from the Democratic Party. That is why gerrymandering will play a decisive role in drawing up the districts. In this way, the Republican Party will combine rural areas with areas close to the cities so that its candidates have a chance of winning. In fact, there is already talk that they are working on maps of places like Houston, Atlanta and Ohio to pick up new districts. But remember, this is not something exclusive to the Republicans. The Democratic Party is preparing to do the same with the territories they control. Take New York, for example. Democratic state lawmakers move to redraw their own district lines to ensure majority for years to come. NY1. Recently, in the House of Representatives, the Democratic Party passed the so-called People's Bill, a sweeping bill that would put an end to gerrymandering once and for all. Of course, nothing will happen in the end because the bill needs a 60-vote supermajority in the Senate and the text covers too many issues to convince the Republican senators that would be required. And another thing to be aware of is that as a direct consequence of all this practice is that it fuels polarization of the discussion and of political action. So to explain. Gerrymandering virtually guarantees that a party will sweep a district, right? So the real battle for candidates is in winning the primary and getting their party's nomination for that district. Party primaries often favour the more radical candidates to try and gain the support of their party. Their success spurns more moderate positions. Anyway, my friends, that's the way things stand. But at this point, it's over to you. Do you think that gerrymandering should be respected because that's the rules of the game and it's practiced by both parties equally? Or do you think it would be better to limit it once and for all? You can leave us your answers in the comments below. If you liked this video and you found it interesting, please like and don't forget to subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. All the best, and I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.